Hello everyone, I'm Fabio, Lead Machine Learning Engineer at Graphware, and today I'm going to show you our temporal graph analysis. A uh, graph never stands still, they continuously evolve over time, right? Uh, well, when we can capture the time in our data model, how we can really uh, analyze this temporal evolution? We want to know what is going on into our graph, right? Where the graph is changing, where it's not changing, if there are trends that we can use to make prediction, or we can detect interesting pattern. In, in general, we want to know if we can get useful insight of, out of this graph evolution. So to answer this question, let's start from the data. We analyze this COVID-19 data set. It's a um, collection of, of updated um, scientific publication about COVID-19. And this is a pretty interesting uh, data set because a lot of things actually has happened in a relatively short amount of time. So it's interesting to, to have a look on it from a temporal perspective. When you ingest the data, the COVID-19 data set, you get more or less this kind of, of, of graph or knowledge graph. We are interested mostly on this central part. So let's have a look on what we have here. Okay, down here we have papers, which represent, which are nodes that are representing, you know, the scientific publication. They get published continuously over our temporal line. So we get a, a track of it in this published time property. Up here, we have another type of node, which is the author keywords. The author keywords are keywords showed by, uh, chosen by the author to best reflect the content of the document. This is the definition. We are interesting about that because you know with other keywords we can get the, uh, the you know the understanding of the author of their own work, right? But what does it mean? It means that if we have a paper then mentioning two other keywords, it means that at least the author believes that these two topics are, are relevant together, right? They are actually making making a work, a scientific work about that. But if at the same time we have other paper that are doing the same things, well, it means that, you know, there is some agreement. But since, again, the paper get published continuously, you know, the size of this agreement may change over time, can grow or shrink. Yeah, that's exactly what we are after. We want to get, you know, how the scientific community, scientific community understand about these COVID-related topics and how this understanding is evolving over time, right? Through the, the discovery that we, that we made down the road. But let's get concrete, right? In this example, we have a couple of, uh, um, of topics that are relevant together because at least one paper is trying to do risk mitigation using uh, big data analytics, right? But while we have for, for big data analytics, we at least have many other paper that mention it for infection, disease risk mitigation, this is the only one paper we get on the old data set, right? Mentioning it. So one more question, are they really relevant together or not? If we look closely on the data set, we may see that we have other keywords that really are capturing the same concept. You see here are missing infectious, here we have an extra dash, but we basically capture really the same concept. And we would like them to get connected, you know? And this relationship here actually do exist, not because of the data that we ingested, but because of the meaning of this keyword. We don't want to lose this connectivity when we do our analysis, right? Yeah, but this brings us to the huge topic of how one could cluster keywords in a knowledge graph, right? But luckily, two colleagues of mine actually had a talk about that. And so I will suggest you warmly to watch the record if you did in that time, right? In the meanwhile, I suppose that we uh, follow the instruction and we had our uh, keyword properly clustered. In this case, that's what we get. Now we have these new uh, green nodes, which are representing cluster of keywords, as you can see here, or, or if you want slightly broader concept uh, compared to what you can get to, uh, with a single uh, other keyword, right? But, uh, uh, but I mean, for the rest, it's the same, really, it's the same. We are interested on, you know, the agreement, how the scientific community agrees about these two topics being, uh, being related together, right? To make our life easier, we compute this concurrence graph, it's a pro projection, so at the end of the day, we have only one type of node, the thing that we are interested in, and, uh, you know, one, only one type of relationship. And since, again, paper get published continuously, you know, the strength of this relation is also a function of time, right? So with this concurrence graph, we can really start our temporal analysis. So let's dig it. 
the temporal analysis that we are proposing is a, an unsupervised process. And it is composed by three steps. So let's, let's go through all of them one by one. The first thing that we do is to slice the time. We compute the, the, this um, concurrence graph monthly. In other words, we select the paper that get published on the first month, and we compute the first concurrence graph. Then second month, second concurrence graph, and so on. Right? At the end of the day, we have uh, a bunch of uh, graphs which represent uh, snapshots, right? which represent the state of the, of the graph at that moment. Right? On top of this graph, we run this feature extraction algorithm. It's called RefX. It basically gives you a topological feature at different, uh, um, uh, at different levels, uh, different scale. At the end of this process, for every node and for every uh, time step that we have here, we have a vector which is going to describe you know, the structural feature of that node at that point in time. Now, on top of that, finally, we apply this Rolex, this role extraction algorithm, which identifies the roles every node is playing within its network, okay, and apply a label on it. Now, it, for us, role is really just, um, you know, a tool to, dis to describe complex behavior in a simple way, in a synthetic way, right? Yeah, I can give you an example. Let's suppose that this network represents an interaction between people in, in a workplace, right? You can imagine that you have many different and complex patterns of interaction. But if you know that this specific node is the boss of the company, for example, well, then it's expected that he's going to interact with other people that are playing some role in turn, right? So the idea is that the role extraction algorithm can learn these roles, what, what, what role do exist in the network, and apply this role to every node, right? With this information now, we can do something very interesting. Is that like keep track or track a node, the same node in different time, uh, time frames and see what happens, what is going on. Is, is the role stable like here or is it going to change, all right? We can spot a pattern, we can get trends, we can do all this kind of, all this kind of stuff to answer to our question. This is a real output that we get. And as you can see here, we have a mixture of roles, not just one role. <clears throat> and in this, in this chart, you can see that, for example, uh, the larger the bar, okay, the higher is the impact for that role on that node at that specific point in time, right? So we have a signal here. <clears throat> but before moving on to look at some interesting results, we have to make sense of those roles, right? The process is unsuper an unsupervised one, so we don't have a meaning out of the box. We have to look for it for our, by ourselves. <clears throat> to make our life easier, what we did is to you know, try to see how, say, role two evolves over time, and how, uh, I don't know, page rank is evolving over time, and see if these two measures are uh, correlated, right? And we do that for different type of graph measure for which we know the meaning, right? And we have this result. And with this result, we learn something. We learn that role zero and role two are actually important role. If you are an important topic in core 19, you are definitely high on role zero and role two, right? On the other end, role three and role four are more peripheral uh, uh, roles. And the role four is slightly better connected, you know, to, to the node that net. But with this in mind, you know, every time a, a node is cross this line, cross the borders, we know that something has happened, right? Something important. So what we can do is to blindly put a threshold here and see what we get. And this is something, it's an example of the, of the output that we get with this technique, right? This is the hydroxychloroquine. Okay, we have to search about that, but at the end of the day, we found out that hydroxychloroquine was something that was thought at the beginning to be a possible treatment for the COVID-19, right? But later with clinical trial, we understood that it was not the case. And you can see clearly the rise and fall of the interest of the community around this hydroxychloroquine, right? It's clearly here. Later on, you can see there is a spike, right? But there is also some role three, right? You see these bars. So this means that, yeah, there exists some, some interest later on, or not of the same magnitude as before, but it's something that is most related to, you know, to the periphery, to, to the network. 
Another amazing story that we get is this machine learning. I mean, machine learning for, for these data sets, only for these data set, was not a thing at the beginning. You see, it was really relegated to the periphery. At some point, suddenly, in May and June, it was clear that, you know, you have to cope with this machine learning because the, the amount of data that we got that got published over time is exponentially growing, right? So you have to, you have to deal with machine learning techniques in this, in this field. And so we can see that there is a clear trend that is moving this machine learning topic from the periphery toward the center, center right? And I can also give you something, I mean, some other detail. If you, if you look at that, there is some red bar here that is virtually disappearing, right? Uh, between February and March 2021, right? This is suggesting us that, you know, uh, probably the, the community was, was, was thinking about this machine learning technique at the beginning, at least, like, you know, something useful, a useful tool that you, that you may, that may be helpful to deal with the data. But later on, you know, it looks like that it was clear to anybody that machine learning, machine learning techniques is something that you need to have in your tool belt if you want to do some relevant research about the topic, right? And this is, again, written within the, the bars, right? And there is a story in, the, in these bars. Now, what we did so far is to actually, you know, put a blind threshold with no, I mean, a user intervention at all. If you want to guide a bit uh, the results, what we can do is do this neighborhood analysis. It, it's really, really simple. What we did is to select one topic, one keyword, let's say our subtopic, and look only at its surrounding, right? Then we can keep all the occurring nodes and sort it by relevance and compute these mm, like top 20 charts and see how these top 20 charts evolve over time, right? And we did that. <clears throat> Really, we did that for these two uh, keywords that are SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus, and COVID-19 is the disease caused by the virus, right? If you look at the, you know, uh, um, uh, the graph that you get uh, if you center these two nodes, you know, the neighborhood of these two nodes is very similar. We have a 95% of overlapping, so we didn't expect any differences, you know, in this analysis uh, with these two topics, but but if we look at the uh, term that most frequently happened to be in this top 20 list, uh, we got some surprise. We get for the virus, we get serology, vaccine, spike protein, ACE2, that are really uh, connected to the biological function of the virus and that you can detect it. If you move slightly toward the disease, we start to have something different like, you know, public health, epidemiology, mental health, telemedicine, there was not here. Right? And they are mostly related to the treatment uh, and the impact that the disease has on the public, uh, on the general public, right? And this is kind of a remarkable result, uh, I think, because we basically did nothing. And we start by literally some two um, starting point that was very similar, almost overlapping, right? This means that, you know, the, 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 the analysis is working, is it's able to detect nuances, right? Uh, that are uh, starting from something that is almost not um, uh, distinguishable, right, by 95% of overlapping. Now, this temporal analysis don't have to be, I mean, relegated to this um, um, use case. There are many other use cases in which this type of temporal analysis can be, can be very useful. In the example I gave you before, uh, you know about the, co the workplace interaction. If you are a huge corporation, you can use the temporal analysis to actually keep track of your key people or to detect employees that need to, to be helped to develop their career, for example, because they are stuck in their role, for example, right? Something slightly more interesting and relevant, maybe, it's if you have a criminal or terrorist network, you really want to use this temporal analysis to identify people when they start to play one type of role, right? And so you can have a closer look on them as soon as this happens, right? You know what I mean? Okay, so it can be used also for, for e-commerce to prevent scummy behavior, for example. Suppose that you have um, some of your loyal users that uh, are selling their account to scammers, right? Uh, you will detect immediately. It happens, right? It can, you de will detect it immediately uh, because they will move, will change the role suddenly because of this new behavior. 
or in general, you can analyze your customer behaviors, right? I mean, every time, uh, I think that every time we get human behavior that is capturing in your graph, no matter what, uh, it's peeling to your graph and you have some temporal aspects. This temporal analysis, role-based temporal analysis has proved to be a very useful, uh, extremely, I mean, useful tool to get, uh, you know, uh, to, um, to understand what, what, what is going on into, into your graph. Yeah, and that's it. That's it. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for questions, but definitely. Sorry, Fabio, I was too quick uh, clicking that button. Uh, thank you very much uh, for for your your presentation. Uh, we have uh, time for one question, maybe sure. uh, from uh, from Prasnat here. Uh, how are the individual graph snapshots stored? Is the entire graph at any instant of time dumped and then reread to compute the various metrics? Uh, yeah, we did something like that. We have this the world graph uh, storing new for J, and we when we compute the snapshots. Uh, we uh, we take all this uh, this uh, knowledge graph and we put that out of the Neo4j. We use network X, for example, to compute graph X or Rolex algorithm, and then we store back the roles into into the knowledge graph. So we get back and forth for it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and uh, from Matthew, maybe we do this quickly. How can we contact uh, get more information? uh um from you maybe I'll, I'll i'll put this back on here um so this Definitely. is uh, probably yeah, the yeah, best yeah. way to do it uh you can email fabio you can uh, re reach out to fabio on linkedin uh, and obviously i guess graphaway.com yeah <clears throat> definitely i would love to to hear about you really all right cool thank you very much fabio uh, uh for your time and for your great presentation thank you bye 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 Thank you for, for joining the, uh, the talk. I'm going to talk about demystifying graph analytics. And uh, what that really means is how do we take these, what are sort of complex graph techniques and things that we can learn about graphs uh, by running sophisticated algorithms on them and turn it into something that we can actually present to an end user and allow them to understand what it is that they're seeing and what un insights you may have uncovered. And also, how do we explain them to people who don't necessarily need or even want to know the details behind what we just did to that graph, but really just want to understand what sort of insight that provides. So there's kind of two main thrusts to this talk. The first one is, how do we present graph analytic type data in a visualization in a way that makes sense? And also, what do we do with it? How do we explain and, and use these techniques in the real world on real data if for a real use case? So I'm going to open with a question here. And the first one is, what does this mean? What are we looking at here? Now, if you're a user of Neo4j graph data science, like I am, or you're somebody who's familiar with the concept of centrality algorithms and social network analysis, then sure, you probably can figure out what this is. Uh, but for most of the humanity, they would have no idea what they're looking at. So the top one is the... Uh, cipher that's required in order to calculate degree centrality on a graph. And then the bottom one is the actual JSON that gets returned when you call that and you get the results back. What happens is it assigns a score to each node, and this is the node ID and the score associated with it. But you're never actually going to do this. You're never going to show this to somebody and expect them to understand what, what it is that they're looking at or expect them to make any decisions based on this data. So the centrality and degree centrality is a really powerful thing, but you have to actually present it in a way that helps somebody understand what they're looking at and make sense of it and make decisions based on it. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk through a few different graph analytics algorithms and then also actually show you visualizations which present that in what's hopefully an enlightening way. And then also talk about some, some cases where using that type of technique might make sense. So the one you saw in the previous slide was called degree centrality. And 
the it falls into a category of centrality algorithms, which fall into a broader category of what's called social network analysis. And what that's really aiming to try to do is to understand which nodes are the most central in your network, which ones are the most well connected. But central could mean a bunch of different things. And there's a whole bunch of different ways of calculating what central is, depending on what it is that you're actually trying to uncover. And degree centrality is really the most simplistic of it, and it's the easiest to explain and the easiest to understand. It's basically just a score assigned to each node for how many links it has. And the nodes that score higher are probably more central to the network or more well connected. And we call this social network analysis because it was originally designed to look at networks of people and how they might be talking to one another or communications or things like that. But the whole concept has evolved such that you can run this on different types of graphs that don't necessarily have to involve people or social connections at all between them and still get interesting and valid results. But for the purposes of today, I am going to stick with uh, networks which are comprised mostly of people and relationships between people. So the reason you might want to calculate degree centrality is to present to somebody, these are the nodes that are the most important in my chart, the most well-connected, the ones that maybe you should pay closer attention to or want to focus on. And there's a couple of different things here. You can uh, just calculate the sheer number of links associated with each node, or you can weight them by some sort of property on the link. So over here in the screenshot on the right, I've got a network which is comprised of individuals with inside in an organization and the links are the emails between them. And let me show you a live example where we've taken degree centrality and we've turned it into a graph. So this is the same data we were looking at earlier. We've got a bunch of different people and we've got links between them when they email one another in our data set, which happens to cover a couple hundred thousand emails between these individuals. And we've modeled that as a graph, obviously. So each node is a person and the link between them is the, the email. Now, degree centrality is just going to count the number of links associated with each node. And what can I do with that information? Well, I can just show that count to an end user in a table. Uh, that's what I did at the beginning with that JSON object. But what I like to do in the visualization, and you can do this with Bloom or with a bunch of other tools too, is tie that to a visual property of the graph itself. So if I calculate degree centrality here, I've taken the size and the color of the node, both of which are pretty useful metrics to associate with the centrality of a node because they stand out visually. And you can see the nodes that got larger are the nodes that have the most links. Now here, I'm just using the simplistic metric of calculating the number of links associated with each node. We can make it a little bit more complex. So right now, a link is a link between two people. They've emailed one another at some point in our data set. But it doesn't take into account whether that's one or 100 or 100,000 emails between these people. And that strength of the connection can really make a difference. So if I take that into account, what I did was I just assigned, I did two things. I assigned the width of the link to bind to the number of emails between these people. But I also told the degree centrality algorithm to take advantage of that so that links that are thicker because they represent more communications between those people are weighted more heavily. So I'm not just counting the number of links from each node, but I'm counting the number of emails from each node. And you can you got to see the nodes change size here. So while previously everybody in this group was roughly the same size and color, when I used degree centrality and chose to take advantage of the link width or the number of emails, Tana Jones stands out quite clearly as being the biggest communicator in this network. She's both sending and receiving a lot of email in this, uh, in this data set. So degree centrality is a really simple uh, calculation. It usually can run quite quickly on even on very large data sets and it can produce pretty interesting results and it can allow your user to identify very quickly in a visualization which nodes it is that they might want to focus on or pay more attention to. Uh, the next one we're gonna take a look at is called closeness centrality. So if I go back to the days about 
10 or so years ago, actually closer to 15 or so years ago now, where uh, I was working with the US intelligence agency and we were assembling uh, graphs based on intelligence we'd gathered from criminal gangs or terror cells or things like that. And I was using uh, social network analysis algorithms to try to identify based on the intelligence we'd assembled, what the most important nodes were, who's the leader of this organization. And closeness is one of the ways that we do that. So what closeness does is it says who has the most reach throughout the network. So it's not just sheerly counting the number of links associated with each one, but it's saying how far away from each node in terms of how many hops do I have to go in order to encompass the entire network. So it's, it's a sense of how big the reach is across the entire network for each node. And a corollary to that is which nodes, if I were to remove them from the network, would most disrupt the shape of the network. So if I were to take people out of this network, uh, how disruptive would that be to the network? How difficult would it be to communicate if this were a criminal gang? So I think of closeness kind of as a, uh, a targeting metric. Who is the most important person if I were to arrest them or potentially worse if this were a... Uh, you know, a terror cell or something like that, and who's, who's likely to cause this most disruption? And that might not necessarily be the leader of the organization. It could be somebody who's responsible for communicating across different parts of the organization or holding the whole thing together like glue. So let me show you two examples of this. So the first one, if I go back to this previous example here, and instead of calculating degree, I calculate closeness you see that the size and shape of the nodes changes. So the larger nodes now are showing me who has the most uh, breadth and depth throughout the network, who's going to encompass it all. In this case, it still is Tana Jones um, because she's so well connected to other people themselves are well connected throughout the network. And so she's, if I were wanted to remove somebody from this network, then Tana Jones might be the first place to look. But let's look at another example now here too. I've got an example that's showing me a, uh, a network of mafia members in Sicily. So much closer to the kind of intelligence gathering that I used to do here. So these people are colored by being representative of uh, various families and they're sized and colored by their closeness score. But what I can do is remove nodes from the network and see how the network changes. So if I pull out the largest node or the largest two nodes, I can see what changes. And I can see if I go all the way up to taking, I have to take out the largest 10 nodes before I really break this big segment into two different sections. So if I take out those people, now all of a sudden I've got two separate groups who have no connections between them. And the layout is allowing me to see how that might change the structure or the shape of the network based on removing those. So it allows you to play these kind of what if games. So now let's take a look at another one here. I'm not gonna go through every centrality algorithm. There's, there's um, well more than a dozen. Uh, and at some point they all start to do the same thing. But between the centrality is interesting because while I thought of closeness as sort of the targeting algorithm, who should I remove from the network to cause this most disruption, break it up into pieces, make it so that they can no longer function. Between this is more of a surveillance type algorithm. Who might I want to pay closer attention to or look at the data that's going in and out of that node to try to learn as much as I can about the workings of this network. Who is the most likely to have information flowing through them? And the way that's calculated is it looks at the shortest path between every node and every other node on the chart. And it says, how often is a specific node on that shortest path? So something out here on the periphery of the network is never on the shortest path between two other nodes, but somebody that's here in the middle could be acting as a funnel or a conduit of information or data as it flows across the network. So let's go back to the example I was showing you previously with uh, the, the network with Tana Jones here. If I were to switch this over to calculate between this, now I'm seeing that the largest reddest node in this network because it has the highest between this score is John Lavardo. So in this network, if I were interested in trying to uh, pay attention to the data flowing in or out of a node, he might be a good place to look. And you can kind of see that visually in the example, because if somebody out here that's in, say, Tamara Black's section of the network 
needed to communicate with somebody down here, you know, in Kimberly Bates's section of the network, it looks pretty clearly like they're going to have to go through John Lovardo in order to do that. He's going to be the, the way that data flows from those disparate parts of the network. So a good place to start investigating if you want to understand the con uh, funduit, uh, sorry, the funnels or conduits of information as it flows across the network. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna move on to is outside the realm of centrality. And centrality is all about, about trying to uncover the most central nodes. But there are other things that you might want to do in your network as well. So you may want to uncover clusters. Now, a cluster is defined as a group of nodes who have more internal links to other nodes within that group than they do externally to other members of other clusters. And there's a bunch of different ways you can calculate how to find those clusters, but they generally come up with similar results. So over here on the right, I've got an example that uh, shows the members of each cluster color-coded and the calculation which is trying to uncover what those clusters is has done a pretty good job of being able to recognize that this is an isolated group, which is pretty obvious because it has zero links to anybody outside of this group. This one is a separate group, this one here in orange, because it has only one link to the members here, which are in blue. As you get very tightly connected networks, where every node is connected to a large number of other nodes in your network, the clustering algorithm doesn't work as well. But that's also useful evidence to say maybe there aren't independent clusters uh, or groups in this network that I want to pay attention to or that might be useful for analysis or visualization. So in this case, we've assigned a unique color to each cluster, but you do have to be careful about doing that because by assigning a color to each cluster, you're sort of implying to whoever's looking at this data that there's something in the data that is saying that these are somehow different. They're of a different type or they represent a different property, but that may not be the case at all. That might, may not even be true. The algorithm itself is the one that's determining that these might be members of different clusters, but we don't know that they actually are. We don't know that we might be missing data or that the colors don't actually represent anything um, inherent in the data itself. And then we can group by clusters too. So this is useful when you have a really complex data set and you wanna simplify the view of how you're presenting it to the end user. So let me show you an example of this. So in this example, this is where I was showing you the, the clusters before, and uh, it's the same data set. So we've come up with the same clusters with uh, the various colors representing each one. And it's a complex data set. You don't might ne necessarily need to, and especially as the amount that you're visualizing grows, look at each individual data point itself. So if I group here, what I've done is I've created a group uh, based on each cluster. I've represented that entire group as a node. So I still have the general the uh, structure of the graph in my visualization, but I don't have the uh, representation of every single individual node shown. So I can see you know, the clusters which are well connected to other groups on the chart, the ones which are uh, less well connected are out on the periphery of the chart. But if I do actually want to look at that individual data here, I can actually open up the clusters and look inside of them. So now I can see you know, this group here, which is, these sort of greenish type nodes are connected internally to other groups here, which uh, show the members of those clusters. So you can have as complex or as simple a visualization as is, is helpful for you or for your end users. But you do have to be careful with this grouping too, because the grouping by cluster, again, it even more so than the color is implying that there's something in the data which is causing you to create these groups. They're members of a same, the same family or they're you know, uh, representative, they live in the same country or, or town or something like that. Whereas that's not actually true at all in this case. They're being grouped together because they are similar in structure to the other nodes in that cluster, not because they share any property intrinsic to that node itself. So I do like the clustering algorithms, but you do have to be really careful there that you're not showing something that you didn't intend to or creating an implication uh, that isn't actually in the data. The next one is paths. Now, it is one of the reasons that you use a graph database is to be able to do these sort of traversal type queries. And oftentimes that's because you want to 
understand the shortest path. How can data flow or how can something flow from one node to another on the chart? But again, it's a, there are a couple of different ways that you might want to show this to the end user, but it's not inherently obvious if I just give you a list of the nodes that represents the path between these two or the shortest nodes, the shortest path, then uh, that's gonna be actually useful to somebody. You can show that on the graph to say, this is the shortest path between these nodes. And I think that that's a reasonable way of doing so. But you have a limitation in that you don't necessarily, in many cases, wanna show the entire data set to somebody just so that you can highlight the shortest path between the items. The other items that aren't on that path may not actually be relevant to your end user who's trying to understand what they're uncovering in the data here. So let me show you this too, because I think the way that we've animated this example is pretty interesting. So in this case, this is like a example from the back of a, a road atlas, uh, which you know don't really, road atlases don't even really exist anymore, but back in the day, you could go to the back of it and it would show you cities which were connected to each other and maybe the distance between them in miles or how long it would take to drive between those two cities. So if you're planning a road trip, you would want to identify what the shortest path was between these two. Now we all just turn on the GPS. But if I wanted to, in my graph, just figure out, you know, how do I get from Toronto to Richmond? We've used animation and the shortest path algorithm and the width of the link, the color of the link and the um, border of the node all to identify what that path is. So you actually got to watch the path flow from Toronto to Richmond and identify that shortest path. Now that path can be calculated a few different ways. It can be just simply what's the fewest number of hops between those. It can be in this case using trying to minimize some property of that uh, uh, that's on the link. In this case, maybe the distance, the mileage distance between those two cities or the drive time between those two cities or surely just the number of hops. Now, uh, uh, different ways of calculating it can show different ways of uh, presenting that to a, a user. So in this case, we've chosen to do the color to show uh, based on how we are actually calculating that shortest distance. And I think the animation there can be really powerful as well. Now, the other piece is the shortest number of sequential paths, because so far we've really only been talking about uh, graphs and the node link representation of graphs and how do I visualize those and how do I represent things on a node link visualization. And those typically aren't very good at showing times or sequences. And a lot of times your links are gonna represent events. This is something that happened out in the real world. And those things happen at times. So I may want to know not just what's the shortest path between Ella and Josephine in this example, but what's the shortest path that something could have actually taken. So in the email example, the emails are actually events that all have a date timestamp associated with them. But if I'm saying, how did a information get from somebody in the top part of this network? If I go back to my social network example, you know, we were talking about information flowing from Tamara Black down here to Kimberly Bates. Well, if I'm interested in the path that might have taken, obviously every sequence, every subsequent email has to have been sent after the previous one. There's no way that John Lovardo could have sent a message to somebody down here in the bottom section of the network before that message actually arrived at him. So when we're looking at the shortest path, unlike when we did so with uh, the drive time, where we don't necessarily care about sequences, uh, oftentimes we do want to know what, this, what I call the shortest sequential path. So that's kind of what we're seeing down here in this example. We're saying, find me the shortest sequential path from Ella to Josephine. Well, we can't take this first link into account because first of all, it's in the wrong direction. We can't take this, uh, this red link into account because it happens before anything flowed to John. So John talking to Josephine at that point isn't relevant to my query. The shortest sequential paths is the ones that I've highlighted in green here. You know, Ella speaks to Nathan, who then speaks to John, who then speaks to Josephine. And that's not necessarily the shortest path, uh, even in terms of sequence, because we have uh, a previous example here of Josephine talking to John, but that's the wrong direction. So that's not what we're looking at. So we might have a directed network too. 
that can make uh, a difference here. So for those types of things where we're interested in the timing and the sequence of items that are coming from our analytics and trying to present those, I think a timeline or a timeline combined with a traditional node link representation can be really valuable. So what I've done in over here is I've created a timeline on the right, which represents money flow transfers between various accounts. And over here on the left, I'm sorry, over here on the right, we're showing the same thing in our node link re representation. So I've got $7,500 going from a casino account to a checking account. But if I'm interested in perhaps uncovering fraud or trying to discover how the money is flowing from one node on this chart to the other, then the node link isn't going to tell me that. If I look at this example here of this $9,000 flowing from one checking account to the other, the timeline is what is showing me the actual transactions that are represented by that link, which in this case is not even just a single transfer. It's several different transfers, which all sum up to that value over the course of a few different months in 2021. So by combining a timeline type view of this data with a node link representation of the same data, you can really present things like shortest path or things like shortest sequential path in a way that stands out. It makes it pretty obvious what it, to an end user who doesn't necessarily have to know how the algorithm works, uh, what it is that they're looking at. And then the last one that I'm gonna go through here is what we call uh, all paths. And we get asked for this a lot at our company um, how do I find every single path between these two nodes? Because I'm interested in how could pop, what are all the different ways that data could have flown from one node to another uh, over the course of the data set that I have? And there are absolutely some use cases where this can be a valid question to ask, but I've found that more often than not, it's actually not that helpful. And the reason why is because eventually all paths is very likely to encompass every node on the chart. So if we look at this example here, you know, a naive example would just say, well, how do I get from node one to node six? Well, I could go one, five, four, six, or I could go one, two, three, four, six. Uh, but in reality, there's a, every single node could be involved in this path. I could go one, two, three, four, five, four, six, I could go one, 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 one because of that self link to five, four, three, and then just go around that link, that loop as many times as is necessary to get to six. And I found that in a large number of examples like this, when you are interested in all the paths between two nodes, you do find that uh, that's not always the most useful question to ask because it's every node on the chart could be a member of that path at some point. It can be helpful if you have directed links and you have a very sparse chart and you're only interested in a path that takes the direction into account, or it could be interesting when you have a sequential uh, type scenario and you're interested in only links that occur after the other. That would vastly cut down on the number of paths that you want to show, uh, the number of possible paths in your network and you want to show those to an end user. So I wanna take a step back and just talk a little bit about the tools that I've been using here in the visualization. So everything that I've shown you today in terms of how to present the results of graph algorithms to an end user can be done with really any number of different visualization tools. You could build something yourself with D3. Bloom has a lot of this capability as well. Uh, what I've been using is our tools, uh, toolkits, which are called, uh, which, which are called Keylines Regraph Chronograph and they are for embedding inside your application. So if you wanna create a, an application and white label a component to do graph visualization or timeline visualization inside of those, then that's, that's what we do. And so we specialize in the ability to take complex graph data and present it in a meaningful and useful way to an end user. Keylines is our JavaScript toolkit. Regraph is our React a toolkit, which accomplishes basically the same thing, uh, but it's designed for React developers and in a very reactive kind of way. And then Chronograph is our timeline uh, piece, which I showed you a little bit of today. So I left some time at the end here to answer any questions that you might have. So feel free to ask questions now in the chat. And as soon as I stop sharing my screen, I'll be able to see those, uh, but also do feel free 
to email me afterwards if you're interested in taking a closer look or you have any questions about how to visualize something or anything else that I've presented. I'm more than happy to, to answer anything that you might have. And thank you very much for attending. Okay, so I'm taking a look at some of these. There's actually quite a few, so I may not have time to get through every single one of them. Um, but let me see. Uh, I did talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the other tools. D3 is an example that, that comes up a lot. It's really powerful. Uh, it does require quite a bit of development expertise uh, to get something uh, that's useful. But once you do, um, you can do a lot of this uh, with building it yourself. Obviously, you can use our stuff too, but I'm not going to try to sell you on that. Um, another question I see here is around the, the size limit. A lot of that depends. I'm doing in-browser, in-memory visualizations. So all of these things are stored in the browser uh, and I'm presenting them uh, with JavaScript in Canvas and, and WebGL. What that means practic from a practical standpoint is once you get into the high tens of thousands of chart items, nodes or links, you start to get some frame rate issues, especially when you notice um, uh, you want to run animations and things like that. A lot of that does depend on the client side hardware and a lot of it depends on the tool that you're using too. So uh, something which uses, uh, you know, SVG might start to bog down a little bit earlier than something that uses WebGL. Uh, oh, I, I, I see a question from somebody who's really interested in the uh, road Atlas. Yeah, I still have my 2008 Rand McNally road Atlas, uh, which is the last year that they actually put it on paper. I can't say I use it that much anymore, but that's where I got the data for the, uh, the demo I showed you. Um, yeah, uh, a question about whether it's possible to integrate what we have with Neo dash. My answer is probably yes. I've actually never tried to do that, but, uh, I believe that that, that could be done, um, but I'd have to take a closer look. Okay, I think that that's all. There are some more comments here, but I just don't have time uh, to be able to go through all of them, but I will save all of these and uh, I'll try to reach out to anybody that uh, has a question with the answer um, offline. Thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate it. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Chaitra Rawara. I work as a machine learning engineer at Twitter. And uh, over to you, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jainal Ahmed. I work as an uh, AI projects lead at uh, Google Cloud. Uh, I talk about mostly about you know, ML advocacy, uh, trying to evangelize new things. So that's, that's about me. So we'll quickly jump into the session. Uh, Tom, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm Chaitra Rawada, and I have my co-presenter, John Ahmed, here. And we are here to walk you guys through how to take data to the next level with graph machine learning. Now, let's zoom out and see how large-scale connected data has led to digital megatrends, like data-driven discovery and innovation, hyper-personalization, or AI and ML, in AI and ML. And I'm pretty sure all of us here would have experienced at least one of the applications like product recommendations or personalized healthcare or price optimization and et cetera. Now let's see how these different arrays of data are stored and consumed. We have one to many relationships, like you know, a customer buying multiple items in an order, many to many relationships, like how different products are bought together when you look at it from an organization standpoint or hierarchical data, like product details, like where you have a department, underneath that you have category and Within that, you have subcategories and et cetera. Now, all of these data points are typically stored in our legacy SQL systems. Uh, like consider your transaction data where we store uh, at, where we store every order and their order details in one individual row. And then we could we use data lakes to transform uh, these transaction data by joining with customer data or with product data, et cetera, to, to build columnar relationships with uh, across different data points. However, there's a hidden data where we can also leverage into different rows, uh, the relationship between different rows. And why do you think that is important? 
consider social media platforms or big e-commerce companies like amazon or enterprise uh, co- uh companies like google right they all have these networks where they uh, they, they know what a, what a customer had bought what they have viewing it or what they have bought previously what they're interested in and etc they give you look at this example right you can actually know that a customer lives in a particular country likes uh football and is a fan of a particular fc club right and the probability that if you recommend them for a match in a uh, match where the club uh, where the football club plays the customer is likely to go or if you uh, recommend them a jersey of that football club then the person is likely to buy so you are actually uh, enabling customers to make informed decisions by you by leveraging this cluster of knowledge now our traditional dps don't handle these relationships well like though uh, earlier like i've said right we do have uh, we can uh, we could join to get those columnar uh, relationships at the same time we could do uh, joins for individual rows and get row wise relationships but then as the level of relationships increase the more and more relationships you want to join your join complexity kind of increases and that leads to your uh, your performance that affects your performance which leads to uh, which becomes really hard to maintain and very difficult to scale it to and it especially becomes a bottleneck when you want to do all these uh, iterations in real time now let's see from no sql databases like we do have key value pairs uh, db like redis or columna db like cassandra or document db like mongo db over here you you can struct you can store your data in an unstructured data like you know uh, in json or in different formats you would require uh, you you would you like but then you you still are not able to have the row to row relationship which we mentioned earlier and that's where graph db kind of comes in and neo4j actually enables you to have the relationship between two different rows so now let's uh, read or look into more about the anatomy of the graph right so every graph has nodes and every node has properties where we store the data in a name value pairs like in this case we have a person called uh, persons with property called name the date of birth or geography or when they have joined a particular platform and etc and now two different nodes are joined uh, by edges uh, which are called relationships there's there's unidirectional relationship or bidirectional relationship now let's see where how this uh, how our neo4j actually fits with go- suite of google cloud databases for document uh, for document data we have firestore for key value data we have cloud big table similar for graph db we have neo4j so this uh, this is how we can use different dbs uh, within google cloud and the advantage of uh, neo4j is uh, it it can be used by everyone uh, who consumes data like uh, we it has uh, it we can query the data in human readable format it also has built in algorithms like page rank or graph stage where you can actually get uh, the values out of it sorry uh, we can it actually uh, yeah page rank or graph stage and other algorithms where you can get embeddings which are which are uh, which are kind of needed in this uh, in this uh, scenario right consider we have lo- a lot of uh, cate- categorical data uh, have a lot of high cardinality which results in very sparse data and that's when embeddings kind of help in in uh, in using those sparse data and convert to embeddings so that we can use those embeddings as features and we can model our ml model from there on now let's see how Neo4j uh, is can be used in Google Cloud as an, in end-to-end ML architecture. We have cloud storage where we uh, where we can get where we get data, or we have BigQuery where we fetch data and we transform it in the data flow pipeline. And from there we can we can pass it to Neo4j GraphDB where it converts your structured data into graph data. Or in case if we have live stream of data, we can actually pass. to apache spark and get real time uh, graph built on top of that data and now we we would pass it to uh, either 
Neo4j graph data science where we can use the uh, built-in algorithms or we can also build custom algorithms on Vertex AI. And similarly, we can also use Neo4j Bloom to actually build uh, business intelligence reports and uh, put it up on Looker dashboard which, and visualize it on Looker dashboard. We can consume uh, both of this data if we want in real time, uh, or we can uh, host it and we can get live stream of data on Kafka as a service. Um, that's mostly about uh, my time. Uh, I really hope you you were able to understand how Neo4j, why graphs are important, why GraphDB is important, how Neo4j can actually help in end-to-end -end ML model. Now I would like to pass on uh, to join us for you for him to walk you guys through a demo where we use Neo4j with Vertex AI. Thank you. Thank you uh, for going over all the graph TV concepts. Uh, now what we'll do is I'll go over uh, a very simple use case, a very simple example project on uh, uh, fraud detection using the PCM synthetic data set and uh, we'll use Neo4j for building the graph and building is creating the graphical history between these different uh, attributes and then we'll create our meetings out of it and we'll then use vertex AI for training the model exposing them into an endpoint and we'll start making it prediction. The whole notebook is available on Google's GitHub so you can uh, actually go and uh, uh, try this uh, example uh, yourself. I think that would be more helpful for people to get a hands on understanding of how it works. And also the whole uh, uh, thing is covered in a Google blog. So if you want to go ahead and read, uh, feel free. Uh, going ahead, so this is how the project uh, or the use case is uh, planned out. So we have this different data that aggregated transactions, uh, the client profiles, overdraft limits, uh, initial ba balance distributions and others. We'll collate uh, everything together and uh, create a graph out of it. Now, once you have that graph, uh, we'll leverage those embeddings to train a model with Vertex CI and then expose them as an input. It's demo time now, so I'll just quickly go over the notebook that I have. Uh, I might not go it in a very detail on a like line of code basis, but I'll give you an over understanding of what is happening. And then you can go ahead and uh, try it yourself uh, on your own uh, time. So here to start with, I connect to that uh, graph DB and on that uh, just doing, uh, uh, I'm just exploring the data, doing some simple EDS steps. So here I'm just trying to explore uh, what are the kind of labels I have on my data set. And for that I run uh, this simple graph uh, db uh, neo4j query called db uh, dot labels and yield labels so i'm ext extracting all of the labels matching this uh, criteria and i'm just counting uh, how many of uh, these happens here right? so i can see uh, the labels like cash in cash out payment the uh, transactions these are our, our top top levels uh, in our data Similar thing, I just explore uh, what are the kind of relationships that we have on the data. Again, that's a very similar similar query to extract all of the data, uh, all the relationships that we have on our data, and it shows uh, perform to next. These are some of the top uh, relationships that we have on our data. Next, I just want to explore the transaction type. Again, a very similar, so I am matching the T transactions and uh, summing the amount, uh, global sum count matching this criteria and exposing uh, exporting them into uh, our table right uh, exporting them into a data frame so that we can ex explore them further <laughs> now that we have uh, this graph we know a bit about uh, the data itself let us now uh, create uh, new features with the graph embeddings so for that i am uh, again running uh, this relationship query, so client perform transaction to a, another client and I'm extracting all of this data out and the embeddings uh, that were there along with uh, the number of transactions, total transaction amount is fraudster, right? If that transaction or if the client is a fraudster or not. So I'm exporting everything into a data frame and uh, this shows that uh, this query run, ran on about uh, 11,000 nodes and it uh, and 26,000 relationship counts. 
now once i have this data i can uh, you know mutate it even further uh, to so that so that this uh, this uh, fast rp right which is a very uh, more featured in uh, high performance uh, node to vec uh, algorithm so i can then convert these nodes into vectors and then uh, start to leverage them for my model now now once i have these uh, data right the embedding uh, the label right if it is a faster or not the number of transactions which happened and the total number of uh, total transaction amount that was involved uh, for for the simplicity for, uh, for the sake of simplicity what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, dump these data as a csv files into cloud storage and from there i'll read this data for uh, training the models uh so once i once i uh, dump this data here into these uh cloud storage paths i can then create a, a ai platform or what it's a tableau data set uh, i pass on the cloud storage location that i have and uh, give it a name now once the data set is created i again create an auto ml uh, tabular training job and and pass on uh, the data that i have uh, and uh, which target to predict on that data split and other metadata which is specific to this kind of model and tell it if it is a classification model and and other details right now once i do that this is going to start a model training job and we can quickly see this model training job here right for example uh, if you quickly go through this link we can see that you know uh, like all the metadata which is attached to this model how it performed how like how much it will see it gained uh, we can also look at the column metadata what are the kind of data that we had uh, uh, instances of of each of the data we can also explore them and now uh, going back now that our model is trained uh, we can then explore uh, expose this model as an endpoint using model.deploy construct and just pass on the machine type that is required for it once that is done we can now start consuming this model from that endpoint make predictions for that uh, you know reading that huge csv file from that cloud storage might be difficult so which is where we leverage uh, uh, gcp what it say features to so all my data which was in uh, these uh, csv files i just uh, i just repopulate them into a feature store so from there i can start consuming them into my endpoint to make the predictions uh, yeah so once i do that uh, so this is an example uh, api call construct which i have used here uh, if we just look at so this is the feature that i am creating for my example uh, call so i have this number of transaction i just wrote it 80 total amount is this and the saved embeddings that i already have i appended it all and this how this instance of data looks like now i can call uh, my endpoint with uh, endpoint of predict and pass on this payload uh, for it to predict and what it does is it predicts uh, that uh, with 80% conf 88% confidence that this instance or this user is a fraudster uh, and uh, and the model is pretty confident right so now from here uh, that you know you can pass on any data uh, any data from uh, from your real time uh, environment to predict and then take downstream application downstream uh, decisions on top of that Uh, that's all that I had. There are just uh, two more pieces of uh, code snippet which will help you to clean up your Neo4j and Google Cloud environment. Uh, going back, uh, if you want to learn more, uh, you can go to these links neo4j.com/google. So you'll get to understand the Neo4j and Google Cloud ecosystem and how they fit in even better. Uh, for uh, you know, if you want to go ahead and do some certifications, uh, have a hands-on understanding of the things, go to neo4j.com/graphicacademy. and you'll be able to you'll, you'll be able to do some of these uh, gds and uh, you know uh, graph db certifications uh, and these are very helpful certifications uh, uh, for you to understand it in a bit more detail have a hands on understanding uh, for for the purpose of this uh, use case uh, you can go ahead uh, in our uh, git repo and find the notebook available there and start using it thank you thank you everyone Thank you, guys. Thanks for that uh, presentation. It was great. Um, I think I can see we had a question come up, so 
we've got a bit of time to spare, so I'll definitely post this to you. We had um, Alexander Nicholas had a good one here. If I can show this on screen, he said, from his experience doing machine learning, it is required to pre-process the data before doing any data training and testing and evaluation using the models. How accessible is the graph data on Python? And can we process it as simple as using a CSV or XLSX data set? Any thoughts? Uh, yes. Uh, so it is very simple, right? Uh, so let's say if you want to, um, you know, once you have populated your graph uh, data in, uh, you know, in a new project database, so you can quickly run your, uh, most of the common algorithms right there using the simple, uh, you know, graph dot, uh, Cipher uh, faster, but if you want to do it in, in, in and go ahead in a bit more detail, let's in this example how we you know extracted those embeddings and then uh, those embeddings we stored them in CSV. So for each node, you have them embedded, and then you leverage them um, to now train a tabular model or, or any any sort of other models. Right? The other use case could be you could you know take a snapshot of it uh, graph itself, and it's very simple, right? You can you can use these uh, Python uh, the the packages that uh, helps you to create those graph. So you can embed in, uh, you know, use those to create those graph and then run uh, GCN's model on top of that. Excellent. Thanks for that. I can see as well that there are many people who are interested in getting their hands on some of the resources uh, throughout the presentation that you linked at the end. Um, I understand we're going to be uh, making the presentations available after the event and we'll certainly get everyone notified when the recordings are uploaded and uh, ready to go. Um, so we'll definitely get those out to everybody. Um, is there any more questions in the chat? I think, oh, here we go. We've got one from Gary Goyal. Does adding a huge embeddings data slow the performance of Neo4j with respect to real-time BR requirements? Is that something that you run into? You could shed some light on, guys. Uh, I like this question. Uh, so it shouldn't really impact the performance uh, as as much as you would expect, right? Like, like, uh, like with complicated joints and stuff. So, uh, and also by huge embeddings, it also depends on uh, the the layers of embeddings you want to have, right? The number of neurons you want to have. So uh, short answer, it wouldn't really affect much. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Oh, we've got another question here from Timothy Huey. There's a question about the schema. Should transactions be nodes or relationships? Thanks, guys. I've seen some company put transactions as nodes. Uh, so the transactions can be uh, you know, the relationships, but uh, the product or let's say the person right, who did the transaction, let's say if I do a transaction uh, with Chatera, right, so we are the nodes and the nature of transaction is the, is the relationship between us. And you could also have like product details in the node itself, like node properties. Yeah. Thanks, guys, and thank you, Timothy. Ah, nice, Janelle. I can see that um, he's put some links into the chat as well. So uh, anyone who wanted to get their hands on those, please uh, have a look at what Joanelle's just linked. And uh, that should be good. I think uh, if there's no more questions, feel free to check, keep them in the chat, guys, because we still have some time. But if that's it, then... Uh, we're happy to uh, go to a little bit of a break, perhaps. Sure. Thank you, everyone. All good, Thank all you, good. Everyone. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Chai Chai. <laughs> Have a fantastic day, and uh, we'll see you around. Sure. Sure. Oh, actually, uh, you. before you go, <laughs> we've got a <laughs> question snuck in there. That's all right. Um, I've got one from Amber. Amber Lou, how many relations can one known ha one node have? Is there any limitation? Janelle, that one uh, might have to go to you. <laughs> it is it is limitless virtually, right? So it depends on the kind of instance that you are running that TV on top of the kind of memory it has. 
you know, it, the graph doesn't has a limit. It is that uh, there's you'll hit the infrastructure limit when you try to operate those. So you might have to upgrade your under, underlying infrastructure uh, if you anticipate that your graph will grow over time. Excellent. I can see Rohit has chimed in as well in the chat. No, there is no limitation. Thanks, Rohit. Um, no worries, guys. Uh, if you want to jump off, um, we'll have a little break until the uh, next talk kicks off in 10 minutes or so. Sure, sure. And uh, like if anyone has any follow-up questions, maybe we are on LinkedIn, so reach out to us there and we'll have, be happy to answer any more questions. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.